Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Behind the Scenes brought to you by BVR Productions. My name is Vincent Aiello. I'm your host. We will take a look at a popular YouTube video, as we always do on the series. And joining me today is retired United States Navy Captain Fitz Lee, call sign Dud. You might remember him from episode five. You came and talked about tanking. And then you joined us again for a live Facebook question and answer. How's it going, Fitz? I'm, uh, I'm doing well, Joe. Thanks for having me back. Cool. Well, it's been a little while. Anything new? Last time we saw you, you were flying for the airlines, living in Coronado, helping at the church. All that's still the same? That's a good life right there. <laughs> so we haven't touched a thing. Still All the right. same. Just got back from Hawaii a couple of days ago, uh, living the dream. Excellent. All right. Well, you being a former LSO as well as a CAG Paddles airwing LSO, you're going to help us out today understand a little bit about what landing signal officers do. Now, this particular video called Landing Signal Officers USS Gerald R. Ford, that is the newest carrier we have, has not that many, about 7,300 views. And then we have another one we're going to use that's unlisted, but that is sent to me by one of our listeners, and we'll use that to describe what we're seeing. So first off, when we hit play here, we're going to see an F-18 already coming across the ramp. But explain to us, first off, who are landing signal officers? All right, so the landing signals officers are the folks that are responsible for the safe and expeditious recovery of aircraft uh, at the aircraft carrier. Uh, the emphasis is on safe mm -hmm. and then expeditious. Okay. And so we're there simply to back up uh, the pilots. Everyone that you see in that picture is a pilot. Okay. They come from the different squadrons throughout the air wing. Mm -hmm. They are uh, handpicked by their command. Uh, so they rush to do this and some are picked and some are not. Typically, yeah, right. that's okay. exactly how it works. And uh, having a you know, a, a good performance behind the boat is usually something that you'd like to see, but not okay. necessary, All right. right? The willingness to learn and improve, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so this is a collateral duty for them. So these fellows, and I think there's a lady on the other video, they will be out here maybe on a Monday, but on a Tuesday they might be flying and be up in here. Yeah, what you see right there is actually an LSO team, typically uh, three, four teams that, like I said, they are on duty that day. Mm -hmm. uh, typically we don't have them fly. Uh, their job is to be out there for every single recovery. And you're seeing them right now uh, as a team watching that airplane, keeping it safe, and then, of course, grading that ah, landing. All right, well, we'll get to that in a moment. So already here, anyone who's listened to our sister production, the Fighter Pilot Podcast, has heard us talk in episodes 13 and 14 about day carrier landings. And you can see that it is uh, out here with a very short runway. This particular video will cut to another angle here. Here you go. And not a lot of spare room. I mean, this guy's landing right here. And that video we had or view I should say a moment ago that's over here right so you are on what part of the ship well we're on the back aft there on what we call the port side the left side okay. of the ship is as you see it moving forward okay uh, yeah, and that's called the LSO platform all right now everyone on the flight deck normally during flight quarters is wearing these float coats and these can inflate if you get blown into the water to keep you upright of course but they all wear cranials as well and eye protection now for LSOs I've had this question on my show before they don't wear cranials. Uh, they will wear earplugs, and I assume that's just for self-preservation. But what's the thought with not wearing cranials, just for those who keep asking? Yeah, well, it is primarily the, the attenuation that you get for those ear cups on the cranials in particular is pretty significant. And believe it or not, one of the things that we use, one of the tools that we have are our ears. Really? Uh, right. So we can hear that jet engine out there at a half mile, what it's doing, whether it's spooling up, spooling down. You know, most of our motors these days are low smoke motors. You can sort of see that, but also that sound of what the in, uh, airplane is doing is actually very important. Ah. With the uh, earplugs, you get some, obviously, it's a compromise between the uh, hearing protection mm -hmm. uh, required and, uh, and then being able to listen. But by, uh, by policy, we are not, we're the only ones that require, uh, not required on the flight deck to uh, wear cranials. Now, we do are required to wear float coats. Ours are colored white which is the uh, color for safety. That's right. And so uh, you'll see the safety squadron safety officers wearing, uh, uh, or representatives wearing white on the flight deck, but they will have cranials on. And then of course, that's a very typical uh, shot of the uh, white paddles uh, okay. float coat. All right. And you made emphasis of the point at the beginning that it is the safe recovery of aircraft. I would suggest that I don't remember off the top of my head, maybe you do, the hooked to ramp clearance here, but boy, this is a fairly narrow window just to take a step back. I mean, you and I live this life, but for everyone else, 
This is not a normal aircraft landing. Now, this is a very narrow window you have to arrive in as the pilot in order to land on an aircraft carrier. Yeah, roughly speaking, you're trying to fly, uh, you know, your head right here mm -hmm. through a box that's, uh, you know, a couple feet wide and a couple feet, yeah, on a perfect curve right. if you're approaching it. Now, you mentioned the hook to ramp uh, clearance, and that would be the t from that tip of the hook to the ramp. It's very hard to judge it here with the perspective and video, but mm -hmm. normally we're going to fly a three and a half degree glide slope and achieve a 14.1 feet of hook to ramp normally. Right. So there, you know, you can see this is an airplane. You could do some, you know, it's roughly 40 feet long. You could do some math. He looks a little low there, a little low flat coming across, but that's the, <laughs> the old L, That's right. Yeah. All right. Not, you, not horrible, but... Do, uh, do you guys keep low. track of how many passes you grade? I mean, can you take a guess at how many passes you've seen in your career? Yeah, it's got to be... It's got to be 10,000, you know, around yeah. that mode. I mean, you think of all the SLPs we've, right. we've done. Uh, yeah, it, it's, um, it's, it's unbelievable. And, uh, and a couple of those were me. Yeah, yeah, I sure yeah, was. You were uh, cat paddles. I'm on. sure they were all okay. Oh, passes. I doubt that highly. Now but. your audience might go all okay. That's kind of an insult, but actually it's not. That's the highest grade we can achieve. We're on a four point scale. That's right. An okay pass is actually the four point A fair. Like pass. an A, right? It's an A. Yeah, a fair is. Yeah, and a fair is a uh, is like a B, I guess, and that mm -hmm. would be a so that's a three O, and then your your uh, you know your no grade. Which is a two zero, right? Uh, and then you have various types of wave offs, right? And, and bolters, and bolters. Mm. Bolters actually better than the no grade for folks. It's that like a two point five, two point five. Right? Although I've gotten a no grade bolter, you can have that too. <laughs> yeah, and that might be a whole oh, other good discussion oh for one of your podcasts yeah. and how we grade uh, landings. We, we've talked a little bit about it before, but not in great detail. So I think this particular video just keeps cutting back and forth. And again, you can get an idea here of just how narrow the landing area is, and the LSOs turn and they watch this all the way down i mean they own this pilot until he or she stops and then of course at that point there is a yellow shirt waiting to take him over yeah so i want to go to this other video which is unlisted because i'd like you to help me understand what we're looking at or what you were looking at as the lso so what are some of the equipment here available to the lso's well it's it's hard to make out but what you can see here is a television uh screen and both mm -hmm. of them here have it and this is important. The perspective on this screen is one that is taken from a camera that's in the flight deck on the center line. Okay. And so I, I think in maybe other videos we're going to see, you're going to see that perspective. And this person that's, uh, the LSO is here. So there's three LSOs that you see that have um, headsets okay. in their hands. So uh, as you see the uh, the team here, you've got uh, this LSO here, uh, known as the controlling LSO, primarily responsible for the glide slope, okay. whether he's high or low. Right. And next to uh, the uh, this LSO is the backup LSO. Now, the backup LSO is primarily responsible for lineup using this TV uh, okay. uh, picture that they've got in front of them, but also has to back up it with glide slope as well. So it's actually the harder position to do. Mm. It's the backup position. And it's so this is a senior LSO, typically more experienced. Okay. If you had to choose between who's doing what, uh, you, you start over here, eventually you move over to here. Okay, once you gain yeah, some experience, you gain some been experience. Up there a while. And then, and then the, we don't see it right there, we go. Uh, that's most likely CAG Paddles, who is ultimately in charge of everything, but he's overseeing the entire operation and, you know, by virtue training these, okay. these, these people. And that CAG Paddles will always be up there when air wing has op to be air operations are occurring has okay. to yeah yep. i gotta have at least uh all right one cag paddles up there okay so in this particular video you can see a flight of three coming in and the first one is going to uh, break right behind the boat there always cool yeah. now what's going on here okay so uh that's a, a signal that lets everybody know that the deck is well, I think that might have just been, might have been waving. Yeah, that's what I'm waving, but he, he'll you'll do it see, again you'll probably see it in a second. And shit, yeah, there we go. Everyone's uh, got their hands up. This means that the deck is foul. That means the deck is not ready to recover that aircraft. Now and we can see that here in the red as well, right? Yep, that's okay. a deck, uh, deck edge status light, and you okay. can see it red. Now it can be foul for lots of reasons. There's the men or equipment are inside the landing area, which mm -hmm. obviously that'd be apparent, but less apparent to folks. Uh, and stuff that you can't see in the video, but it's indicated to us on the on gauges down on these uh, on these two boxes, uh, sets of boxes here, is every single wire, the four wires that stretch across the deck. Or in case of this is a Ford, it could be a or you know. I think we've switched over now, so this is maybe Reagan. Uh, yeah. Oh, Reagan. Anyway. So Reagan only has three three wires right. actually. But right. so all those wires, the tension on those wires, the what we call the weight setting, has to be set, and all of them have to be set for that aircraft type. Okay. So that could be the, the deck air edge could, or deck area could be completely clear, but the, the wires are not set properly. 
then the deck is foul. And so we held up our hands to make sure everybody knows it's a foul deck. We okay. But now this guy who was standing out here, and I'm going to see if I can do this with this uh, button. He is. Uh, he was standing out there and almost backwards. to say, yeah, basically, yeah. hey, hold on. But now they still have their hands up. The light is still red, but yet he gets out of the way. So yeah. what's happening there? So he is calling the deck. And we instituted this sadly, like a lot of things that we institute in, uh, you know, in naval aviation after some some sad mishaps where we've mm -hmm. actually landed aircraft on top of other aircraft okay. or through other aircraft. And Ouch. so his job is to make sure that the deck is clear. So as I just explained, the deck can be foul even if it's clear. Uh, because the wires, the wires are be set. set or, mm -hmm. But uh, we want to make, we're going to make doubly sure that we've got it clear of men and our equipment. So as soon as he put his da hands down, okay, now the deck has no men or equipment, no aircraft, nothing in the landing area, but it's still foul because we don't have the uh, wires yet set. Okay. And getting back to that, do you have indications on these boxes that the gear is set correctly or is that all just summarized in the status light? Yeah, we're going to have it summarized with a status light. And there's a, over here, mm -hmm. there's a arresting gear officer uh -huh. and, uh, and one of the yellow shirts. Uh, and his job is to also make sure that the deck is clear okay. and equipment, but also to make sure that all. So we have all those indications. When those indications are all met, mm -hmm. then we get the indication from the deck head status lights that we are good to go. Okay. And so these two panels, are they the same and one's just a backup of the other or do they have differing information? Well, those are new panels that uh, actually come after my oh, day. So okay. I, I assume that, uh, I assume those are uh, redundant, but I okay. don't know for sure. All right. Well, sorry. I should have found one that uh, you had used. Okay. So their arms are down now. The uh, light is green. And I've noticed, although we can't see the airplane, their heads, what you and I know from the case one pattern, have been pretty much following what I would expect to be where the airplane is. In fact, here he starts showing up. I mean, when we come into the break, you pretty much own us the whole time. Is that right? I mean, if we get low out the 180, you're probably going to holler at us. Yeah, absolutely. We, we do. Safe expedition air. So as soon as you come in uh, to the break, we certainly own you. We're checking to make sure the hook down, that the gear's down. We're mm -hmm. double checking the pilots. We're making sure that all the, the gear are, in fact, in battery. Okay. And then at this point, this pilot has everyone's utmost attention. Mm -hmm. And although we haven't seen it yet, these are all officers and, as you said, pilots. There's at least one enlisted man yeah. or woman up here. And He's what the hook is spotter. That? Okay. So his job is to literally look with, through binoculars, verify that that is no kidding an F-18, either Super Hornet or what we used to call the Legacy Hornet, because mm -hmm. they have different weight settings. They right. look really similar, so it's very important that we know what kind of aircraft it is so they we set the, you know, the, the gear... Uh, settings, the weight settings underneath the deck are set. And again, we don't do that at the LSOs. That's actually engine rooms right. that, are, that have that, and we've got to make sure that's set. So, yep, he's out there looking and backing up the LSOs to make sure we've got okay. clear down and right up. Right and up. the point of the Hornet and the Super Hornet looking so similar, is that why they put the strobe on the port side of the nose gear for day operations, that's right? exactly why so they did you for see the Super that, Hornet. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you see that strobe, you know that it's a Super Hornet. And oh, by the way, that's why they had to come up with a different name on the ball. That's right. It's not a Hornet ball, it's in this case Rhino ball. You wouldn't want to say Super Hornet ball, because if the Super got cut off, then right. you would have a problem. All right, so you made a comment before, there's a little bit of that smoke, and some of that mm -hmm. is there. And you would probably make the case that this is a bit of an art, right? I mean, you've got the horizon. You you know after several of these, and uh, our guest for the day landings, by the way, Farva, who is an LSO, he talked about, you know, if you're standing behind the plate as an umpire, every pitch looks like a strike. But after a while, you can start seeing the differences. And yeah, so that's a good analogy. You, you pick up little cues, don't you? Like the height up and down, the attitude of the aircraft, the sound, the smoke, the way the flight controls are moving. And sometimes you can see things, I know this was definitely true for me, not being particularly adept at this, is that you would say something to me like a little power well before I thought I needed it. And so what is that? All those cues basically? Yeah, and it's amazing because so, so obviously all the LSOs are pilots. And so I know it very well from both sides of the, uh, and right. I know for a fact that LSOs have done the same thing for me Really, we can uh, sometimes pick it up more quickly than the than the pilots can. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we always tell the pilots, too, our job isn't to tell you what you saw, is what you did. Right. So. <laughs> and not every pilot is okay with that because sometimes there is some disagreement on that. Yeah. Here again, we have the hook to eye. And, of course, this particular camera looks like it's got a little fish eye, maybe. So, at any rate, uh, boy, that almost looks like VFA-94, but I can't quite tell. There's a Charlie coming aboard. And so what I want to show here, though, is that he watches it all the way down, listens to make sure there's power in the wires. And I've told my listeners about my story with that. I one time forgot to do that. Didn't go well for me. But what I want to say now is, what's he doing right here? 
And who's this guy? Okay, so <laughs> that's another LSO. His duties for this particular recovery are, is the book writer. Okay. So as we mentioned before, every landing is graded. So he's writing down the side number, the wire that they caught, and the, the controlling LSO mm-hmm. is going to spit out the pass. Okay. Uh, a little too much power in the middle of the high and close to at the ramp. Okay, four wire. That's maybe how I would have graded that pass. I have no idea. I'm looking at it from a YouTube video. <laughs> That's right. All right. So does he just say whatever he wants and this guy's got to write down some shorthand or is there some sort of code? And I know I'm setting you up for this, right? Well, it is the shorthand. That's the, yeah, it's the code. So right. it's, it's a shorthand uh, because, you know, I'm going to say it that quickly mm-hmm. and we've got an airplane that we see, see where everyone's head, well, luckily sure. hers. But this whole time you were saying that yeah, he Yeah, what you want to be careful of is see everyone turning their heads into the, the book right now. Mm-hmm. So that's why we quickly get that pass out because our job is is primarily safe and expeditious right that grade is the last priority but we want to make sure we get it uh, we're going to obviously debrief every pilot and then we're going to move to the next aircraft okay so once the previous aircraft got out of the way and the, the area is clear he gets out of the way yep. and then at this point the deck is still foul because maybe it was a hornet and now it's going to be a rhino ah yeah. but it's green they just need to put their hands down yep. at this point there you go just saw it. and along comes the next pilot awesome and then at the end of the recovery you LSOs as a team will go down and confer briefly, right? To just right. make sure. So uh, the CAG LSO obviously leads the team. We'll discuss every pass individually to make sure that we kind of agree with that. Yep, that's what it was. Mm-hmm. Just as uh, as Favre that was uh, talking about uh, the balls and strikes, uh, this is where we get an op- It's almost, almost, we don't have any kind of actual replay, but this is where we're going to go, hey, because, you know, watching baseball, some are tweeners. Right. And so, you know, uh, we might go, okay, nah, that was a, that was an okay pass. Right. And we changed the, the, you know, too much power and close high at the ramp to a little too much power and close, a little high at the sure. ramp for the okay. Now, I'm going to call you out here, Paddles. Does mm-hmm. it ever matter to you guys who the pilot is when you're doing that? Like if it's the air wing commander? No, no, not at all. Okay. No, seriously. I mean, okay. that to me was a point of integrity and, and I, uh, absolutely not. Now, where that might come into play is who actually debriefs that particular pass. Ah. And we had some, I've, I've had some folks that were, uh, sadly enough, only the Air Wing LSO would, would debrief Is them. that because the person was not too receptive? Yeah, and senior. Okay. But so so, right. so be it. But normally what we'd like is the guy who's controlling. Mm-hmm. In this case, there's a reminder, this is the controlling one. Right. The one who's actually spitting out the grade. Mm-hmm. He's the one who debriefs. Okay. Typically. Because that way, he has the credibility of, look, I saw it, I controlled it, I, I called it, yeah, he meaning called it. what he's doing right here. Yeah. And then earlier, I don't know if she'll do it this time, but the backup LSO, I, ca- I saw it, here you go. She's leaning over like, well, that was on that particular not enough power, it was on a drift left or something. Right, right? so she'll, yeah. what she's doing there, uh, she's adding some there, she's adding mm-hmm. some lineup comments that he may not have seen. Gotcha. So, yeah, so just like you said, maybe that was a little too much power on lined up right in the middle. Okay. Something like that. As he's going to recorrect for his lineup, he right. has a little too much power to his high or something. Her uh, jersey, I just noticed, by the way, uh, said VFA 94, so that probably yeah. was them. All right, so because, again, to the point, it's easy for the controlling LSO to see glide slope deviations but the left and right are pretty subtle without using the you can see it almost there right yep. there's that little airplane so that's what she's staring at yep. okay and then again cag lso is monitoring the whole thing developing the team making sure they get it right now i saw someone with a wristwatch and kind of hacking what's that all about yeah so we're striving for typically uh on the very short side 45 45 to 60 seconds between landings okay and then we're also looking, you know, 15, 18 seconds in the groove. That ah. in the groove is when he rolls uh, wings level three-quarter of the untypical. Anyone who's seen Top Gun, three-quarters of mile will call the ball. That, right. that defines the groove. And uh, you don't want to be long in the groove because if you're long, that means the person who's setting his interval trying to be 45 to 60 se- seconds behind you might really start to eat you up. And now we have to buy a wave off because the aircraft are too close together. And that keeps the carrier steaming, uh, you know, in a predictable manner. For right, which we anymore. don't want. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So you're going to see this guy 45. So that was a perfect interval, arguably. Then he goes back and assumes his position. Everybody else does their grading yeah. and on to the next aircraft. What's a typical recovery as far as number of aircraft for, let's say, cyclic operations? Oh, well, I'd say, I don't know, uh, 14, okay. 18 maybe. It's, All right. It's been so while. theoretically, that should take less than 15 minutes, uh-huh. ideally. Ideally. Yeah. 
And we do that after we launch the next waves of, uh, yeah. of aircraft. Launch and then immediate recovery. And then recover. Okay. And of course, we haven't seen it here, but there can be other types of aircraft coming in, an E-2, a C-2. Um, I guess, uh, what else is there these days? Uh, <laughs> prowlers are gone, so the growler. But now, this person is a VFA, and that's a F-18. When an E-2 comes in to land, will he hand it over? That's a great question, and the answer is no. Not necessarily at all. In fact, he's... Every everything that you see there has mm -hmm. been assigned for that recovery. So you've got a, you've got the controller, the backup, the rider, the deck spot or deck caller, mm -hmm. cag paddles, obviously running the whole show. Now, if there's a particular aircraft emergency that comes up, sure. I'm the cag LSO. I'm going to make the final judgment of who's doing what, and that might change roles for a particular situation right. during the recovery. But no, uh, generally speaking, everyone's going to maintain that. Role. Okay. So just because I fly an F-18 doesn't mean I can't wave the E-2. And then the E-2 pilot, LSO later, might wave the F-18. Yep. And those are all the different quals we spoke of. You've got the field qual, the wing qual, oh, et cetera, yep. et cetera. Yep. All right. Awesome. Well, Fitz, I want to thank you for coming and joining us here today on the Behind the Scenes. For our listeners, if you enjoyed it, please make sure you like, subscribe. That way, any updates will show up automatically. And for those of you so interested, come on over to patreon.com. Look for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, our sister production, where you can not only help support the show, but you can gain access to our content early as well as exclusive content. Whether you sign up as a flight student all the way down to the air boss, that dictates the benefits you enjoy. So thanks for tuning in this time and we'll see you next time.